Good afternoon. Welcome to the December edition of the Credit Union Tableau User Group. We're going to be getting started in just a couple of minutes, maybe one more. Um, if you have not already signed up for our mailing list and want to make sure you get our roughly monthly updates on, on meetings upcoming in the Credit Union Analytics uh, world, uh, be sure to just add your name to the link that is on the screen right now and we'll make sure you get updates. Some of you might be coming over from the Power BI user group. You are able to select whichever combination of meetings you'd like to join. Um, again, we'll start in just a moment. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, to those of you who just logged in, welcome to the December edition, the last of 2020, sorry, 2019, Freudian slip there, the last Credit Union Tableau User Group of 2019. It has been an excellent year and we're excited to cap things off in style. A uh, couple of logistical notes. If you would like to ask a question, and we encourage everyone to ask as many as you, as you so desire, please use the Q&A box if you hover over the little uh, black rectangle on the Zoom screen, you can use the Q&A there. If you have specific questions for any of us, there is a chat function, but we will definitely be monitoring the Q&A throughout. Um, we will be sending out both the recording and the slide deck after this, so do not worry if you are scrambling to take notes or something. We will definitely be sharing both. And you have access to uh, the panelists as well as my email address if you do want to follow up with any specific questions. Okay, let's jump in. So today we are just going to run through a couple quick community updates and then over to our primary speaker. I just wanted to highlight for everybody that the Credit Union Tableau user group, which kicked off over a year ago, uh, has been a huge success. And we did get reached out to from a number of different people who said, well, what if I'm on Power BI? Well, although we like to think that a lot of the things we talk about here in the TUG are technology agnostic, we do obviously focus on quite a few Tableau specific topics. So if you are interested in joining the credit union folks uh, who are doing some specific calls uh, with much more of a Power BI focus, there is a group for that and you are very much welcome to join. And then also I wanted to highlight that given the interest from people using Click, people using Power BI, people on Spotfire, as well as uh, people here in the Tableau group, we are looking to have a couple of uh, sort of big group community calls, uh, webinars in, in the new year, where we can talk about things like governance, team building, and, and other topics. So if you have suggestions on the kinds of questions you'd like us to discuss, or you want to get involved, you want to suggest a speaker, you want to speak yourself, please go ahead and contact me or do so via the, the sign up form where we have a, a place where you can raise your hand for that. Okay. Just a quick reminder, we do have an online community page hosted by uh, the benevolent forces of the Tableau community. And in addition to posting any of the recordings and any of the PowerPoints which come out of these meetings, there's also a discussion panel where people can post questions and post resources as well. We have a, a two-page PDF there that has a whole bunch of links and trainings and the related topics. Um, and so I highly suggest you head over there. You can also find the link to our mailing list page there as well. Now, without further ado, I do want to introduce our speaker today, Melissa Pomeroy, who is the Director of Business Intelligence and Project Management at St. Mary's Bank, which is, uh, if you don't know, the first credit union in the United States. Uh, Melissa has been uh, a wonderful support to the Tableau User Group for Credit Unions and actually spoke at December's uh, meeting last year. And we we're really excited to uh, check in with her again, see where things have gone, as well as to celebrate and hear a little bit more uh, as she was selected to be a presenter at this year's Tableau conference, which was very exciting. And I was, I was thrilled to have been able to hear her presentation there. So. Without further ado, I am handing the reins over to Melissa and uh, let's see what we've got in store. Real quickly, before I do that, please, just a reminder, use the Q&A box. She'd love to answer your questions and we will be sending out the recording and the slide deck afterwards as soon as possible. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charlotte. 
And it is, um, very, I'm very excited to be here. I, I can't believe that it has been a year. Um, I, I know Charlotte mentioned I, I spoke at this group last December, and I, I would have guessed that was just a few months ago. So time, time sure does, uh, sure does fly by. And I also know, um, I don't think I'm wrong in saying I'm, I'm pretty certain that last December there were not a um, hundred or more participants. So this is fantastic to see so many people uh, from this industry join join this group. Um, so I, as Charlotte mentioned, my name is Melissa Pomeroy, and I am at at St. Mary's Bank. I've been here for about about five years, uh, and I did have the privilege of speaking at Tableau this this year in Vegas just uh, last month in November. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure there were several of you uh, who are on this call right now who who also uh, were able to attend that conference. It was it was fantastic. Uh, lots of um, great sessions and uh, you know the the area to kind of go mingle and and meet folks and and all things data was uh, was fantastic. It's my first time presenting and my my second time attending and it was um it was just wonderful. Uh, what I'm going to do today is is walk through the presentation that I gave at Tableau this year. Now, some of it is a little bit redundant to what I spoke about last December. Um, so there are a few pieces of this that I'm going to gloss over a little bit because um, I'm starting to learn my story is getting a little bit old. I've got to come up with some new material. Um, and I want to make sure I have some time, one, to, to take some questions, but also um, to show in a little bit more detail some of the dashboards that we have um, either built or that we have been, been offered uh, through our platform. Uh, within the past year. So uh, without further ado, I will I will jump right into this. And as Charlotte uh, already mentioned, St. Mary's Bank is the nation's first credit union and we uh, we were founded in 1908. Um, 2014, which is when I started St. Mary's Bank, started here at St. Mary's Bank, uh, that is when we jumped into our, um, you know, call it our data journey or overall technology upgrade. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about here is how we have gone from 2014 to 2019 and what we're planning for next year, um, given where we started, uh, which was with very little, even very little reporting and absolutely no data analytics. And I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about the journey and, um, and what some of the, the high points are and, um, during that journey. Um, but I, I broke this down into three, three major steps. And, and obviously, as every one of you knows, since you're at some point, um, in the data journey, I'm sure some of you are farther ahead than we are, some may be just getting started. Um, it's oversimplifying it to say that, you know, we've done this in three steps, but I really want to highlight these three because I think they're the most applicable to what might apply to some of the challenges that, that you're facing in your own um, organizations today. So uh, the first step, we were going through a system conversion and our data was a mess. We did not have a one data warehouse. We did not have a central repository for data reporting, analytics, or anything. Um, so the very first thing that we did, actually the very first thing we did was hire a data consulting firm to come give us some help with cleaning up this data and figuring out how to approach this. And um, some of you may be familiar with uh, a company called Architecture. They are a data consulting firm out of Maine. Uh, we are in New Hampshire, very close by. Um, we asked them if they could come on board and help us, and they did. The very first thing that they did was build um, an enterprise data warehouse for us. And what this allowed us to do is um, establish a single source of truth. We got all of our source system data in one place, and we were then allow, uh, enabling ourselves to demonstrate some consistent reporting. So again, in our, in our old pre-conversion legacy world, multiple different systems, no single source of truth, and we had kind of a... a certain way of doing reporting from all of those legacy source systems. In our new world, we were converting to a new core. We were moving to um, Ephesus, Scimitar's Ephesus, but we were still going to have to maintain and manage multiple uh, different subsystems and ancillary systems. So we were able to take the data from all of those systems and get it all in one place. Uh, and what that allowed us to do is kind of provide that landing that landing pad from, from where we will begin our whole data and reporting transformation. Uh, the first thing we realized, even after we got all of our data in one place, is that it's, um, it's a mess. And uh, many organizations, when they're about to go through something as major as we did, which was the conversion of our, of our core plus um, dozens and dozens of other systems as well, they say, oh, now's a good time to, to try to clean this data up. But we were a little bit overwhelmed. We had so many systems, so much data, and we hadn't really done this in uh, decades. Um, again, 
something that we decided it's probably better to get this done now. Let's get it out of the way before we jump into our, our fancy new systems. Uh, so what Architecture did, who was on board and having just completed um, architecting our data warehouse, um, they introduced data quality dashboards. And what this was, was an ability for us to identify any type of data quality rule that we had defined via a Tableau dashboard. So Tableau was a brand new thing for us at the time. We bought a handful of licenses, which we managed in-house. They connected to some views in our centralized data warehouse. And what that allowed us to do was define business rules that architecture then built into their rules engine. And it made the data quality errors obvious and available to our different business areas at a glance. So whereas previously, we would have had to manually go in and say, oh, I wonder if, let me, let me just start looking through for some bad birth dates, or let me find somebody who can write a query for me to maybe identify a handful of errors in this specific category or this specific system. Instead, we just verbally communicated all of the business rules that we could think of. So, hey, you know what, if, if there's a, um, somebody who has a, a birth date that is less than a certain age and it's a commercial member, that's probably a data quality error. If we have deceased members who still have open accounts, that's probably a data quality error. And again, dozens and dozens. And you can see from this sample dashboard, which was way back in 2014, the, we defined 143 different business rules. So that was, that was how vast this effort was for us to jump in and clean up data. And if we didn't have the benefit of this data quality rules engine and Tableau to very seamlessly deliver to our different business areas, there's no way we would have done um, anything close to the amount of cleanup that we were, that we were able to do. Um, so again, what you're looking at now is just one of our, our sample summary dashboards when we first started to, to do this. And it identifies the different data quality issues and in which business area those data quality issues exist. Uh, if we go into a little bit more detail here, what we're looking at now is a data quality error summary. And what this does is this identifies the very specific data quality rules that need to be cleaned up. So in this particular situation, we isolated this dashboard to only show us data quality rules for one particular source. And in this case, it's our um, mortgage servicing systems. So we know that these are all issues related to a mortgage or a loan in one of our source systems. It could be in um, our mortgage servicer, it could be in our core, and we, we needed to identify these rules so we could go in and clean them up um, so that they didn't flow through uh, to all of, our, um, all of our reports and all of the data that was being consumed by the business. So if you look here, it shows in the different colors the number of business rules that exist as of a certain period of time. And you can see the some of the cleanup um, that ha is happening over time. Uh, in addition to identifying pieces of data that need to be cleaned up, one of the things that is obvious to me in retrospect looking at this, and we've actually incorporated a data quality program currently uh, in, our, in our business operations today, but what you see here is of all of the data quality rules for this particular source system, almost 48% of them are due to this one rule, which says potentially incorrect real estate tax information. That's interesting to me since that is 3,400 defects since the time that we started gathering this information. What that tells me is, you know what, why, you know, why is this happening? Is this a, is there something that we need to train a little bit more effectively? Is there something in the system that we could do to prevent this from occurring? Is there an error in the system that is resulting in this happening? So what this data quality dashboard does is not only shows me, hey, go in and clean up these 3,400 records, it says, if you have 3,400 records that are, of, yeah, that, that contain an error for this one particular type of error, there may be a bigger, a bigger problem going on here. So this is actually not just a trigger to clean things up. It's also a trigger to, hey, look at your business processes, look at your training, look at the source of these errors and see if it's something we can address moving forward. Uh, as I mentioned, the data cleanup process is something that we have incorporated into our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, we have several different business areas who have a designated resource who every day goes in and looks at this or every week goes in and looks at this depending on their workload uh, and has a process for cleaning up this data. And what you see here is from July 1st, 2018 
until April 1st, 2019, you can look at the number of specific data quality errors that have been corrected. And you can see the progress is that close to 40,000 data errors have been resolved since um, July 18. And you can see that this snapshot was taken in April. So um, there's obviously been, been even more up to this point. <clears throat> so that's step one. Let's get all this data in one place where we can establish that single source of truth. And then two, let's get that data cleaned up so we can really use that as our, um, our landing spot to, to move forward. I mentioned there were three steps. The second step I want to talk about is, great, we have all this data into in our you know, enterprise data warehouse. We're defining it, but how do I get to it? As I mentioned, we just went through a major conversion in 2014-2015. We did not, as a result of getting rid of old systems and introducing new systems, even though we had all that data in that data warehouse, all of our different business areas weren't able to get the same reports that they got with their legacy systems. They were used to something showing up on their printer. They were used to writing a query that someone had written for them maybe years ago that they just had to enter and execute in order to get their information and to manipulate their data. Those vehicles were no longer there for them because we're in a, in a different world. And sure, there are some CAM reports that come out of our core and out of our new systems. However, we still have business areas that really need to just get at the data for lack of a better, uh, lack of a better term. Um, so what we were able to do in order to meet an immediate need um, were to introduce Tableau workbenches. And this is a term um, established by architecture and they came in and introduced these workbenches via Tableau to our business users. And what these workbenches did was they actually just provided a, a lens or an avenue into the data in our data warehouse for the business users. So all of the data gets thrown into the data warehouse and then in, in for example we have a member workbench those data elements that are specific to a member story a member profile members account those are all those all exist not just in the data warehouse but in what we call a conformance layer so our single source of truth sits in our data warehouse in specific uh, views and queries and tables and what this tableau workbench does is it is it calls those tables that contain our single source of truth and provide that information to our membership. Uh, and why that, while that may sound very simple, um, this solved a major problem for us. And that was making sure we were all speaking the same language about many of our, um, for, for many of our reports and the type of information that we communicate on a regular basis. So, um, and I know I'm speaking to a group of folks from credit unions uh, and I can't tell you how many times I have heard somebody reference, how many members do you have at your credit union? How many members do we have? And, and people kind of roll their eyes and say, yeah, I wish I knew. That's a loaded question. What do you mean by members? Do you mean active members? Do you mean members of a certain demographic? Do you mean members within a certain geographic area? Um, it, it is a bit of a loaded question. Um, so what we were able to do was provide, <clears throat> excuse me, um, slicers and data filters within Tableau that would allow a user of this to actually define what they want to know about members. Now our base workbench, when you come up and it shows you the number of members, this defaults to um, the definition of a member as per our charter. So this is obviously, we, this can be customized um, to meet those, uh, that def definition by credit union. So if you look down here, this defaults to member account, account status is open, primary share status is open and the charge off flag is no. And what we mean by a charge off flag is that's something that we just defined in that conformance layer. And we have certain rules that say, if you have a charge off flag and that charge off flag is set to yes, that means you meet a series of quite criteria around charge offs. It doesn't mean that if you've ever had a charged off account, you won't be counted as a member. So again, that's something that we define as a business rule within that single source of truth. And now we're allowed to have our Tableau dashboard look at that business definition in that conformance layer and make sure that definition is reflected in this number that we come up with here. <clears throat> More specifically, we looked before and we said, okay, we've around 109,000 members and this was as of a certain point in time. Um, there are a lot of times where we hear you know, things that maybe are valid, maybe aren't, but just general statements saying, oh, everyone that banks at a credit union must be old. So all of your members must be over 50. 
with a few additional clicks on this member workbench, we can almost instantly see not only the number of members, but also a breakdown based on member age. And what you can also do is go down and um, you can see that the number of members went down a little bit. I only included members who have an active birth date in the system. So we do have some members whose date of birth is less than 10 um, or that date of birth is blank with some data quality that we have to clean up. So um, you can see how very quickly this not only shows us that 50 to 59 demographic, but also shows us how that compares to others. So it turns out, yeah, we do have a lot of people that are older than 50, but we also have a lot of uh, members who are between uh, 20 and 49 as well. So at a glance, we can provide real, tangible, non-anecdotal information. <clears throat> and you can see I had used the member age slicer to show that across the x-axis. And then here's the chunk of folks that are over 50. <clears throat> to get even a little bit more granular, if we want to know how many current members are younger than 30 and are relatively new members, so we're going to say open their membership in 2018 or 2019 and have a loan with us. That is something that previously was either unattainable or would take multiple queries from different source systems and then a lot of kind of heads down analysis in an Excel uh, or even an access database to try to come up with that. Now this information is available at a glance, at a few clicks, to any of our business users who have Tableau access, and I'll, I'll talk through that a little bit more. Um, so if we want to hone in on uh, this particular uh, query, you can see how we entered for the slicers, which are those across the X and the Y axis. We have it broken down by share and loan on the Y axis, and then we have those two, I actually included two um, decades of ages um, across the X axis. And you can look down there in that bottom red box, and that shows us who has an open loan and which members are in a particular demographic. Um, you can also see who has an open share account and who has a charged off account in the top if you want to get some more information. But uh, very quickly and very easy to get that information using these, these workbenches. And we mentioned the, um, I just showed you the member workbench. We have a loan workbench. We have a transaction workbench. We have a card workbench. Um, and there's a, another one that's in the works right now, which will be very exciting as well. But um, those are used daily by multiple different business areas and uh, it was a great start out of the gate to start using those to, to give that access to our to our membership um, so people were pretty happy about that and they said oh that's great at least i can get to my data but then we had some folks in different business areas that said well yeah i can get to my data but then i have to rebuild the report and i used to just get that report off of the printer or somebody used to run that report for me and give it to me now i have no idea how to get that report um, what we decided to do at this point is say, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to rebuild some reports. We're going to say, show me what you got in the old world with our legacy systems, and let's talk about it for a few minutes and figure out where that data comes from in the new world, and then we'll build you a report pretty much that looks like that old report. Um, maybe, you know, the initial reaction is, well, hang on a second, is that the best use of Tableau to make a report that looks like this screen I just brought up here. This just looks like an Excel spreadsheet. This is exactly what the business wanted. And I, I can't say we used great foresight when we created this. We were just really looking for some allies here. We really wanted our folks to, to leverage our single source of truth in our data warehouse. And we wanted to get some traction with Tableau. And one thing, I just wanna pause here really quick before I kind of get into some of these. This is very critical because when I was out at Tableau, conference and just speaking to many people both from tableau and, and from different industries throughout the course of the week one of the most common questions that i got when people said oh hey you're speaking here that's great asked how many users we had they said how in the world did you get this adoption i can't get anybody we do all this cool stuff and i can't get anybody to use it um, when i really thought about that and i really kind of went through like, the story that we were telling and where we were today um, we now have over a hundred Tableau users, and we're a credit union, which means we only have 200 plus folks, many of whom are tellers and frontline workers who, who don't use Tableau yet. And I'll say yet because we actually may be headed there soon. However, we, we were able to gain that adoption and get that traction because how did we start? We gave people what they wanted. This is exactly what they wanted. They were uncomfortable because we ripped out everything that they knew how to use and we gave them all these new systems, front ends, back ends, you know, we went from a green screen 
to a you know fancy web-based system that talks to a different system. So we tried to simplify it as much as possible. So what we show here is actually four separate reports. So back in the old world, this one report here was four different reports. There was the consumer loan loss that showed the current balance and number delinquent. There was a percentage delinquent, year-to-date charge off, and then month to date. And in order for somebody to create these reports, they needed data from multiple different sources and they had to do a whole lot of manual calculations and data entries. So obviously opportunity for some errors there takes a lot of time and it was only available when that individual was able to create this, which was usually weekly if possible, but a lot of times it was just done monthly. Long story short, fast forward, what we did way, way back when we were first getting started is we built them a dashboard that contains these four reports and the information in these four reports, which again is one dashboard, is available every single day as of the last thing that happened last night. No manual manipulation necessary. You can certainly download this data and do something different with it if you would like, but if you just needed this information to be able to send it off or to be able to explain um, particular statuses, totals, percentages, this is available at a glance with absolutely no manual intervention needed. <clears throat> Another example of a report, um, we have a big uh, indirect business. I'm sure several of you on the phone at your credit unions have one as well. Um, but this was a loans originated by dealer report. This was very manual before, and there were a whole lot of manual calculations. And this report wasn't even built frequently or certainly not regularly. And what we were able to do was recreate this. And this is now available on a daily basis uh, and has a date filter option. So you can look at, you know, which dealers are resulting in the most business based on the um, or loan amount, also based on the uh, number of loans. So this is a this information is available daily, uh, and it provides that you know instant visual insight. So this was a big win for our uh, consumer lending department. Um, <clears throat> so that was, as I mentioned, step two. When we're, we're going to talk about a few here, um, when we jump into step three, um, you can see that the reports that I just showed you didn't look well. They didn't look great, but they also certainly didn't look the same. Different colors, different formats, different date filters. Um, we started to get a little bit of feedback saying, hey, why do all my, my reports look so different? And I need more and I need them quicker. So again, we started to get some traction. We started to get some adoption, all of which is great. However, we now needed to turn some things around. So what we decided to do, um, and when I say we at the time, we did not have an in-house data analyst. Um, we, had, we used architecture exclusively for our data report development as well as our um, data warehouse uh, architecture development and uh, ETL development. Um, so we decided to take a little bit of pause and say, okay, where are we and where are we headed? If we want to do a whole lot more reports and get a whole lot more of these things in the hands of our business with Tableau, there's got to be a faster way to do this. So what we would do previously <clears throat> was every time we had a report request or a query request or an extract request, uh, architecture would build, for the most part, a custom query for each one of those new reports. And then that Tableau dashboard would look at that new custom query that was just built and that would take the data from the data warehouse. Um, depending on how those queries were being built and which consultant was doing that and how the, the business rules were defined, there, there was a chance for some inconsistent data. So if two different reports used the same data elements, and even though we're using that same source of truth, if we had some discrepancies in how those custom queries were defined, there's a chance that we could have some inconsistent data. And at the same time, we're basically recreating similar queries every single time we get a request. That's time consuming, certainly not scalable, and it's definitely not efficient. Uh, so what architecture did was develop a set of master views. Um, and this is today what I think is the, the, the main reason, or at least the, the number one and the most prevalent reason why our data reporting and analytics platform is, is as successful as it is today. And that is because these master views feed every single report, every single dashboard, every single extract, every single query that results in data that gets into the hands of the business. And this really enforces our single source of truth. So before we touch one of these master views, it is reviewed very, very carefully to say, okay, do we have the uniform understanding of what, how we want this particular data element to be defined and to be reflected on every, again, dashboard and report that gets into the hands of our business. 
um, mostly what this allowed us to do is churn out a whole lot more reports and, and dashboards and extracts because by using those very extensive master views, we don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. We can develop a different way of looking at the same data. We can develop uh, a different way of leveraging the same data uh, based on the business requirements that come in. So um, we got a lot of great traction with this uh, and we were able to, to really start to churn out more reports. Um, as I mentioned before, we were kind of doing what I called a, a bottoms up approach. And that was, okay, what did you do yesterday? Okay, we're gonna recreate that for you. And, and maybe we streamlined it a little bit more. We certainly introduced efficiencies by getting, uh, automating a whole lot of manual work. So, um, and I will actually go on record to say that has been our biggest benefit of Tableau and a data and analytics solution is efficiencies and consistencies. Uh, I know there's a whole data analytics world that I'm going to get to, and that's very important as well, but um, that really allowed us, again, not only to get that traction, but also um, to be able to streamline so many manual processes. Uh, but we decided it was time to not just do that bottoms up reporting and giving um, people exactly what it, they wanted for reporting. We wanted to do some more goal-driven work. Uh, and what you're seeing here is um, a manual version of our branch manager dashboard. So like um, many, if not all of you on the phone, we have multiple different branches in different locations. Uh, and each one of those branches and each one of the SSRs at those branches has, um, has goals. They have to sell a certain number of loans. They have to open a certain number of CDs and checking accounts and share accounts. Um, and those, those goals are all managed manually at the beginning of the year. The actual number of loans that a branch or an individual opens and the actual number of share accounts that they open, uh, it, obviously that information is contained in our core system. Uh, we had an individual who manually populated a 13 tab spreadsheet to reflect all of our goals and actuals every single month to populate manually the actual information on shares and loans by branch and by individual. So once uh, he, it was a he that did this, um, back in the day, uh, he had to source this information from multiple different places and then manually key that into these 13 tabs of this spreadsheet. So um, this required hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work. And the end result was available in the beginning of the month with data for the prior month. So I'd be waiting around in February to see how I did in January or how my branch did or how all of St. Mary's Bank did in terms of their roll-up goals. Um, a, you know, great pro process, great spreadsheet, certainly um, a lot of opportunity for, for error there. Uh, what we were able to do, what architecture was able to build for us based on our very specific business requirements for how we wanted to capture and report this information um, is they developed a branch manager dashboard. And what this is is a, a series of dashboards that provides one report at a glance showing how, and you can see on this particular one, I know the, the um, screen is a little bit small, but this actually rolls up to one specific branch as of a certain date. And you can see that the data for this happens to be as of October 6th. So the beginning of the month, that month I don't expect to be too far along on, on some of my goals yet, but this what this shows me is how am I doing as of October 9th, month to date, quarter to date, and year to date for my goals for this branch? No manual action, action is needed. Nobody needs to go into a whole bunch of other different systems and, man, and populate information. It is a proactive approach to managing um, sales and services for our different branches as opposed to react, reactive, which was previous. Um, you can see here there's a drop down so you can look at either a roll up of all of the branches in the organization or you can isolate that to look at specific branches and then you can see here we have quarter to date um excuse me month to date quarter to date and year to date and you can change this based on i want to look at the dollar amount or i want to look at the number of loans the number of shares and and how we are accordingly um so again i know i went through that Pretty quickly, I have a feeling some of you have seen this before if, um, if you were around last December on this call, um, but this to date, uh, other than the workbenches, is probably our biggest, uh, biggest win and our most popular dashboard. We actually just recently 
this year rolled out um, an SSR scorecard, which actually shows this level all the way down to the individual sales and service rep. And that provides a vehicle for them to meet with their manager or supervisor on a regular basis and look not only at how they're doing right now, but how they're doing right now compares to their goals from previous months. So it can look at a, uh, an action plan for moving forward. <clears throat> okay, so now I wanna get to the, um, the what, what was mentioned in the title and that is uh, the cloud. You know, I'm talking about all of this reporting that's been done. Um, everything that you've seen up to date was actually work that was developed in-house uh, on servers that were owned by St. Mary's Bank and managed by architecture within our St. Mary's Bank environment. Uh, earlier this year, we very, um, after very, very much discussion and um, explanation to both our board and within our senior leadership team, uh, we made the very strategic decision to migrate from an on-prem data warehouse reporting and analytics solution with Tableau to architecture's cloud-based platform. Um, so we went from, again, an on-premise solution to a fully managed platform uh, specifically for St. Mary's Bank, the platform being specifically for credit unions. Um, what this allows us to do is uh, first of all, the solution we had on-prem was fantastic, but it was not scalable. We were about about at the point where hardware was reaching end of life. We would need to upgrade that. We would need to buy a whole lot more space because the amount of data that we were retaining um, is uh, exorbitant. Uh, so the costs were going up. This was a much more cost-effective way. It also provides us opportunities that we would not have had otherwise. And by that, I mean uh, the frequency and the type of dashboards that are released to anybody that's on the platform, not just for St. Mary's Bank. Um, and it also allowed things to happen um, much more quickly due to the scalable nature of the, of the cloud-based solution and being on the, on the platform. Um, one of the dashboards that I want to um, show right now demonstrates a little bit of our shift from, hey, we do all of our reporting in Tableau from our data warehouse. Aren't we great? Uh, I think that is great because I think that's a huge win to be able to establish that single source of truth and have everybody leveraging and, and using it. However, what we really need to talk about now and what I know many of you are already doing and, and starting to do, and that's venturing into the data analytics BI and all those um, buzzwords that we're hearing in this industry. So um, how do we get action actionable information? How do we recognize actionable information? And then when we recognize it, how do we take action? Uh, what we're looking at now is a member branch analysis dashboards. Um, so there are a few questions that we can ask and that this dashboard kind of prompts us to ask. And the first is where are our members opening their accounts? And right, right here I show a breakdown. I think I have 2018 selected here on this dashboard based on when I took the, the snapshot. Uh, it shows in which branch our members become members. And okay, so they may open their account or become a St. Mary's Bank member at those places, but where do they go to to perform a transaction? And then what's the age distribution of our membership based on where they open their accounts, based on where they perform their transactions? This dashboard provides me that information at a glance, and it's also dynamic. So when I click on one of these bars, it filters down throughout the whole dashboard. So it really provides those insights very, very quickly. Uh, what you're seeing here is a member action analysis dashboard where I have clicked on the McGregor Street branch. So the question that I'm asking is, okay, for those members who are transacting at our McGregor Street branch, that means those of our members who became a member anywhere, how many physically walked into our McGregor Street branch within a time period that I had selected? Uh, and then the next question is, well, what are they doing there? Why are they walking into this branch? Um, are they doing everything? Do we need more loan officers there? Do we need a whole bunch more tellers to, to meet those uh, those needs of those members that are walking in, or they're the same members that are only, always walking in. So what the bottom part of this dashboard shows is that, okay, it shows a breakdown of what those 366 transactions were in that branch. And you can see that they're check deposits, cash deposits, checks, cashier withdrawals. Um, what this dashboard allows us to do is turn that data into information. We can take that information and gain some insight. But now what I can also do from this dashboard is turn insight into action. So right here from this dashboard in Tableau, I can export this member list for an online mobile banking marketing campaign or a type of campaign to target those specific members. So if I want to say, hey, 
who walked into the McGregor Street branch and deposited a check? I can see that 129,000 transactions were check deposits in the McGregor Street branch during that time period. And if you go down into the, the detail in the bottom, that's 13,000 members, 13,000 unique members who walked into McGregor to deposit a check. Why aren't they using mobile banking? What I could do further now in a, a um, subsequent version of this dashboard that we now have is we can say, okay, how many of those members have mobile banking? How many of those members have used mobile banking? And then I can even get this 13,000 number down to as small as I would like and then target them and say, hey, why aren't you using your mobile banking? And obviously say that in better marketing speak or, you know, hey, we saw that you went into McGregor, you don't have mobile banking. Here's a $5 check, come into the branch, we'll show you how to use mobile banking. So um, those types of insights provide opportunities for us to reach our members in different ways. Um, one thing that I find interesting is when we use this dashboard, and if I were to go look at McGregor Street, Elm Street, Hanover, did all of our different physical branches, what I can learn from this dashboard is no matter where people are going, no matter how old they are when they walk into a branch, they're doing the same thing. They're either depositing a check, they're depositing cash, they're taking money out, or they're um, uh, withdrawing a check. So all of those things, do you need to go into a branch for that? Well, maybe they want to go into a branch. Maybe it's time to look at alternative branch options. Maybe we do ITMs, maybe we do more ATMs. Maybe we need fewer tellers, but more floaters who can do a wide range of transactions with members. So it allows us the insights to kind of do some of that analysis. And this actually came in very handy for us recently as we're um, you know, thinking about what our uh, branch strategy is over the coming years. <clears throat> so again, that is a um, kind of a, a strategic approach uh, to using some of these dashboards. And again, all of the clicking and the filtering on that dashboard um, is quicker now that we're in the cloud. Um, it also makes it easy for us to request changes and no fe new features, excuse me, to those dashboards. Um, okay, so what I, what I just showed wasn't really multi-factor analysis. It didn't really include a scientific model. That right there is what we're just starting to get into now. Uh, it's very hard to, to kind of take the time and stop and say, I really want to explore what this platform offers us from a member targeting, member segmentation, based on scientific models that support these dashboards. Uh, we're using Tableau regularly. We get new requests for reports. We get change requests for reports. Uh, we get requests for, for extracts and queries. It's really hard for us to kind of stop. We have two data analysts now and say, okay, let's focus on how we get the business to use these. So that's where we are now. And that's really what we're looking forward to from the architecture platform, which is called Archalytics um, in 2020. Um, so what I have here are just a few examples of some of the dashboards that are available with our premium subscription with Archalytics, um, our cloud-based uh, data analytics platform. Uh, so this is a member segmentation analysis. Um, so based on based on our data that obviously is um, is in the cloud and and supports the platform, what this dashboard does is it um, breaks those members into different segments, and those segments are defined based on the scientific model behind this dashboard and their transaction history and the makeup of their member account. So for example, um, they have this model defines disengaged members. This model defines those members who have a car loan only with us. We have quite a few members who bank with us just because we offer a decent car loan rate and then they may move on elsewhere. Uh, CD rate shoppers, people who jump around and say, I'm looking for the best rate on a CD or I see there's a CD promotion. Um, true CU enthusiasts, and there are definitions for what all of these segments are. But from a marketing perspective, what this allows me to do is isolate based on these segments and then go in and look at, okay, how many people in that segment are in a particular age group? Uh, and then what type of marketing or how do I want to reach out to these members and for what purpose? So this provides, <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, that information at a very, um, in a very visual and a very insightful way. So it, as I mentioned, at a click, you can very easily isolate a member population. And then what we are able to do here is using Tableau, very easily download a member list for a marketing campaign. So you can see here that I'm isolating, <coughs> excuse me, those members who have an indirect only with us, excuse me, an indirect only loan with us, which would be a car loan, um, and are in their 20s. <coughs> excuse me. 
we can produce a, a list for a uh, load directly into our uh, marketing system. Now uh, we use Documatic, so we can export that list from here. Uh, so again, this is one example of one of the member the me member segmentation analysis dashboard, uh, which really allows us to target our members based on those scientific models behind the scenes. Um, and I, I know I touched on this a little bit, but when you know I mentioned we have we do have this has been a long journey. We started in 2014, and when I look at where we've come, it's been um, making the journey to the cloud is something that. At first, we were hesitant. We were wondering we're not going to have as much control, and are there going to be obstacles that we then have to face? Uh, I will say that that transition was very, very seamless to our users. Every bit of functionality that we had on-prem, we do have in the cloud. And in addition, we have the opportunity now um, to really begin to leverage some of those very interesting and very exciting opportunities to leverage these dashboards um, that are based on these. Um, predictive analysis and scientific models that um, that the platform is now producing. Uh, so that is, I know I'm about um, at almost at 320 here. So I am going to pause now and, and Charlotte, is this a good time to, to kind of stop and see if there are any any questions? Yeah, and there's actually a ton of questions. So I think I think that'd great. be great. This has been wonderful, Melissa. I, I can't get enough of the dashboards, I have to say. Um, so let me see, there's a lot of questions that have come in. Um, to start off with, um, Lloyd wanted to know how long it took to replace your branch status overview from all of those legacy spreadsheets uh, and then get it into the new dashboard format. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that took, uh, if you ask uh, the folks that were involved in the heads down sessions, they would probably say it took forever. Um, it did take a long time. Um, and that was with the folks that were actually doing the building and then the, the business users, I would say a month. Um, and that includes the parallel work. So it took a few weeks to get the requirements down and we were not doing this full time. We had business users who had an hour or two here or there to really focus on getting these requirements down and then architecture would go off and build and then we would validate and do it again. So um, it wasn't an all in type of thing. Um, but one thing we did have during that whole month is um, we had we had complete commitment to making sure we got this right, and we did. So uh, a very lengthy plot process. I want to say that it it also took long because at the same time we were building that conformance layer and defining defining that single source of truth. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone as as we went through that one. Awesome. Um, Lloyd actually also wanted to know whether or not you're still hosting core apps locally and then moving the data into the cloud and scheduled jobs, or were you able to move everything um, everything over, I suppose? No, no, we just moved the data well. We retired the data warehouse, and now our data warehouse is in the cloud. So everything, all of our systems are, either, are on prem, and we have jobs that create flat files, and we use Opcon for transfer via SFTP over to um, AWS, which is architecture's uh, vendor for their cloud platform. Awesome. Um, who would you say owns data at St. Mary's? Is that you? Is that someone else? And is that something um, you guys even talk about in that term? Yeah, we, we don't talk about it in that term. I, it, I would say, um, it's, I would say everyone. I would say the, the business areas own data in terms of, you know, what do you mean by a a frequent member what do you mean by a closed loan that's everybody's job from a business standpoint to make sure we agree on that they agree on that single source of truth um, I own it in terms of when somebody needs it when somebody thinks it's wrong I'm the one that has to facilitate making sure it's um, resolved or addressed or delivered so um, we're still I think working on our structure on how that's gonna fit so right now we the the business analytics team, which is my team, um, are separate from IT. We re report directly into the, um, the chief operating officer. Excellent. Um, in terms of the process you use to develop the, me the member segmentation groups, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, I can't, only because um, that, I, I know Fair that enough. that is, <laughs> it's, it's way, uh, way over my head, but um, that came to us from architecture. So when we migrated to uh, the cloud platform, in addition to 
all of the reports and analytics that we worked on with them to very closely define. And we still do that with them. We say, hey, we want this, let's brainstorm on it. They have a team of very smart people that are off building these models to produce these dashboards. And then we you know, pick it apart with them and help them. So in terms of how that model works behind the scenes, I unfortunately can't, um, I can't provide much, much on that. Oh, no, excellent. Um, Jay wanted to know how many data source integrations total have you added since 2014? And then what are the ones that, that might be coming up slash in the long term? Yeah, good question. Um, a lot. I would say maybe a dozen. Uh, and right now we are working on Meridian Link. And right now we are working on Blend, which is a TOS for mortgage. Uh, we have currently integrating with our data warehouse on at least a nightly basis. A couple of them go twice a day. We have MortgageBot. Um, we have Ephesus. We have FICS Mortgage Servicer. Um, we have, uh, we actually integrate SharePoint. We integrate our, um, all of our in-house applications. Like uh, we use iSupport for our help desk. We have all of that um, going in as well. So. Um, we have many, many data sources, but I would say, you know, the big ones being the core, obviously, our loan servicing system, our mortgage system, and again, we're looking now to pull in um, Blend and Meridian Link. Meridian Link is, is the, the big one. Excellent. Um, Eduardo was curious, and I actually, this is on my list of questions as well, was whether you could just talk to us a little bit more about the adoption plan. Who was having access to Tableau first, and then how did you yeah. tackle training and rolling sure. the, the strategy out? Yep. Yeah, we didn't really have a plan. We kind of fell into this um, as part of, you know, doing this massive conversion. Um, but the way we started is we gave business areas who needed to do data cleanup, we gave them a handful of um, at the time, they were called Tableau server licenses, so it allowed them to interact with the dashboard, download data, um, and we had two or three desktop licenses, and that was for architecture uh, and one of our business analysts to, to build stuff on, all on-prem. Uh, as we started to build dashboards that were more relevant to more users, we started to roll it out. We would buy, hey, let's buy an additional 10 server licenses through Tableau. Let's buy an additional... Um, Actually, we never bought more desktop licenses until many, many years later. Um, mm -hmm. What we were able to do before we migrated to the cloud, I, I believe we had 75 users, and that took about three years. Uh, and, you know, in those 75, there are a handful who are, still aren't comfortable with it, and to be honest, probably never will be, which is perfectly understandable. Um, mm -hmm. But we really, really, really gained adoption during that 2016, 17 phase where we were really churning out reports and going around to the different business areas. One of our key strategies was we're gonna interview the business area about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis for anything related to data and reporting. And mm -hmm. we were gonna do something for them, whether it's streamline something, replace something, and that got people excited. And that's how our, that's how our adoption and usage rates kind of took off. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Linda was wondering what kind of uh, sign-on you're using in terms of the system. Is that sort of AWS yep. enabled? Uh... Yeah, so it's, um, it's interesting because when we had our on-prem solution for Tableau, we had a single sign-on. So if you were logged into the network, which you have to do if you want to do any work at, obviously, the organization, all you had to do is click on the web address, the, the link, the icon, and you're in Tableau. One of the things we went back and forth with is when we migrate to the platform, the cloud-based platform, we couldn't do single sign-on across SFTP. So mm -hmm. we needed to either architect a whole other solution or, you know what, let's try to just have users log in. And we actually, users now have to authenticate. They have an email, they use their email address and they have a password and they're able to reset their own password and manage that. Uh, but they just go to a web address which takes them directly to AWS. And all of that um, authentication, the adding new users, the um, modifying existing users is all managed by our service provider who is architecture and they work with AWS. Excellent. Um, let me see. Um, 
did you tackle an overall, it sounded like you, you did approach this in part, but it may, it may be something uh, that's been more in, in, in flux now, especially because I think that there were elements of architecture that, that capture this, but did St. Mary's uh, tackle data governance while completing this um, or what was in place before? Yeah, we did. Um, to be honest, I, I also, uh, second time I've said this, but I can't really speak to what was in place before because I came on board right when we started this. And a, it was all, all hands on deck, all things conversion, let's get to the new systems. And from what I could tell, there's, there was no data governance process in place. There was no data resource within St. Mary's Bank to enforce that. Um, so the answer to the question is yes, we did tackle data governance while we were doing this. And to be honest, I think it's, um, it, it was a perfect time to do it because what it forced us to do was really build that that conformance layer, which is now part of the platform and that, that single source of truth. And, um, you know, without having done that and, and really, you know, going after the, the data governance and getting everybody's buy-in, I, I don't think we would have been as, um, as successful over time. Excellent. And I, you did mention that it sounded like this, but um, Lloyd was asking whether there's a specific data catalog application you're using for, especially for sort of, uh, you know, the, the qualitative terminology of the calculations or definitions? Yeah, you know what, there is not. Um, we do have a data dictionary and it is a um, Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> You're not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, what I will uh, say that what is very interesting is because we have those workbenches, uh, I mentioned our conformance views, which you know, it's only a fraction of the data. You think of how much data from all these systems flows into the data warehouse, that conformance view takes chunks of all of that data that is needed for reporting and defines it and establishes it. So we don't, you know, once you, once we do it once, sometimes we add data elements, like just recently we said, hey, MortgageBot just released a new thing and we want that data in here so we can report on flood zone something. Architecture yeah. updated the ETL and added that, we then have to go add that to our data dictionary. But the maintenance of it is is very straightforward. The building of it was brutal. So, but once we get to that point, it, um, it really manages itself. Excellent. Well, I think we have time for just one more in here. And it, this sounds relevant, especially because of the, it's the way I'm understanding the workbench. But Aaron was curious about whether there was any ad hoc uh, querying uh, that was yeah. in the reporting, maybe more on the actual BI team. It's, Likely, yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic question. And one of the things that we were able to gain as going migrating to the platform. So our users have access to the data via Tableau. My, um, my team, the, the senior data analysts have access to Tableau, of course, they also have access to what is called the sandbox. And what that is essentially is a environment that just St. Mary's Bank analysts can use to either query the data warehouse, query the conformance views, build their own dashboards that maybe they'll submit for inclusion into the platform or run queries or do analysis for the business without having to request architectural resources to do that. That has been um, probably the biggest win for us to date since we've been on the cloud. I'm looking forward to many more wins, particularly using the, the fancy dashboards that are coming out. But for us, having two data analysts in-house and being able to query um, that sandbox, if you will, in that development environment and produce and deliver and service our business areas has been, has been huge. And that database is Snowflake. Um, my two analysts very quickly and very easily um, picked that up. And the querying that they're able to do in the sandbox, in the cloud, is not even close to what they were able to do on-prem. So on-prem, so many of their queries would time out or it would take hours. They had to let things sit. It wouldn't work. Their machines would crash. Doing those types of queries in the cloud um, much, much, much quicker. So they're able to get so much more done and offer so much more to the business. So we do a whole lot of, of ad hoc querying and analysis. Excellent. Um, well, we are, I think, coming up to the point where people are going to need to start to run. Melissa, this was really fantastic, I have to say. Um, and I feel like we're going to get 
more and more questions. Um, I did include your email here, um, and I hope I speak for you and I say that if people do have questions, um, you're definitely a wonderful resource. Uh, we will, uh, everyone, be sending out the recording as soon as we've got that process, as well as the slide deck. And I just wanted to thank you guys again for, for being a part of this group. Please reach out with, uh, with any suggestions of things you might like to see done differently or topics you'd like to hear tackled in, in 2020. And just again, a, a round of virtual applause for Melissa. This was really beneficial and I think a, a wonderful way to, to push ourselves into the new year. So thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. And uh, happy new year, happy holidays. And we will be back in 2020. Take care.